All right, guys, welcome back. Today we're starting with chapter 19 in the book Read Aloud Mockingbird by Katherine Erickstein. Um, and this chapter is entitled Shoes. This is chapter 19. Early Tuesday morning, Rachel Lockwood comes into class and her face is scratched up in purple. Her left arm and her left leg are in bandages and everyone crowds around her saying, oh my gosh, what happened? Are you okay? I fell off my bike, Rachel said. How? Someone asks. I was riding past the middle school and I heard sirens and I thought that there was another shooting. Oh my gosh, was there? A girl asked. No, duh, a boy says. We would have heard by now. Rachel shakes her head no, but I was watching the police car come up the road, so I wasn't watching where I was going, and then I went off the sidewalk and I fell off my bike. She looks down. It, her, it really hurt. I was riding so fast trying to get away because I was scared of getting shot, like... And she stops talking, and she turns to me, and so does everyone else. It was really quiet. I want you to just pause here. Put yourself in Catherine's shoes, or excuse me, Caitlin's shoes, and put yourself in the shoes of her classmates. Back to the book. You should watch where you're going when you're riding your bike, I tell her. That's what Devin always told me. Some people turn away and some people shake their heads, but I know that I'm right. Emma and some of the other girls stand around Rachel, so she's in the middle of the circle and they're all staring at her. I wouldn't like that so much, so I stare at them and I hope they get the message to leave her alone. Finally, Rachel says... Rachel asks if her face looks really bad, and Emma says, of course not. It's totally fine. And Rachel says, really? She looks around, and her eyes st stop at me. I look away, because I wasn't staring at her like those other girls. What? She asks. Her voice is soft and shaky. Does my face look bad? Even though I'm not looking at her, I can feel her look at the person, and I wonder how she knows that honesty is one of my skills. Yes, I said. It does look bad pretty purple and puffy and kind of gross. Rachel starts crying and runs out of the room. Caitlin, Emma yells, that was so mean. Didn't one ever tell you how to be a friend? And that's when I realized that maybe I should listen to Mrs. Brooke when she talks about friends, now that Devin isn't here to tell me. I try to say that purple is actually my favorite color, but too many girls are yelling at me. They say that Rachel will be self-conscious and embarrassed, and it's all my fault. I hate self-conscious and embarrassed, and I decide to help Rachel. I'm a very helpful person. So I look around the room, and I notice that there's no place for her to hide. There's no sofa or blanket or any place where she could be in her personal space and not having people staring at her. So then I have an idea. I pull her desk out of the front row, and I push it all the way to the back corner of the room, and I shove it up against the wall where the terrain was until the turtle died and I hear voices saying what is she doing she's a weirdo she's finally cracked but I don't care I'm being a friend I go back and I get Rachel's chair and I put it under her desk so it's facing the corner now no one can see her face and she can hide from everyone and I'm happy until Emma and Rachel come back and Rachel starts crying again and Emma starts yelling and pulls the desk out of the corner and I try to stop her and Mrs. Johnson comes in and says what in the world is going on and Emma says how mean I'm being and Mrs. Johnson gives me her pinched lip stern look and said what is this all about and I tell her I'm just trying to be a friend and some boys laugh and the girls are mad and Mrs. Johnson takes me all the way to Mrs. Brooks room herself even though I know how to get there. I sit at Mrs. Brooks' table and I cry because even though I work at it, I still don't get it. I was being a friend, I said. I know you were, Mrs. Brooks said, and I know that you might feel comforted by sitting in the corner and not having people look at you. But Rachel doesn't. Why not? To Rachel, it felt like you didn't want her to see her, so you wanted to get rid of her by putting her in the corner. Well, that's not what I meant, I say. I know, but try to put yourself in her shoes. Remember, guys, this is empathy. Walk a mile in another man's shoes, okay? That's what they're working on with Caitlin here. I look at the person. Empathy, Mrs. Brooks says. Remember, it means trying to feel the way that someone else is feeling. You step out of your own shoes and put on someone else's shoes because you're trying to be that person for a moment. In Rachel's case, you want to try to feel how she might feel having all of those obvious inju injuries. I can't feel that, Mrs. Brooke, because it didn't happen to me. I don't have bandages or a purple scratched up face, so I don't know how I'm supposed to feel. I think you can learn empathy, Mrs. Brooke smiles at me. In fact, I'm sure of it. 
She goes on to explain life the way Rachel sees it, but I listen, but I still don't want to tell her that that's not life how I see it. I also don't want to tell her that I'm not sure I can learn how to do empathy. She seems so sure that I can. So I look down at my shoes and I quietly, quietly slip them off. My feet feel cold and clammy because my socks are sweaty. I carefully touch my toes onto the floor, which is cold and hard, and I pull my feet off the floor and I shove them back into my sneakers. At least I tried dipping my toe in empathy. We're going to keep reading today with chapter 20 as well because that chapter is called Empathy. I stare at the sign I put up on Devon's door for a long time. I realize that they are the first eyes that I have ever drawn and how much they look like Devon's. I wonder how the picture would look if I put the eyes together with the broken nose and his mouth. It would be a complete face, the complete face of Devon. And I would always know what he looked like. Even when I grow up, he could always be with me. I wonder if putting the whole face together would help bring me closure. If it's split up in, apart into pieces, then wouldn't putting all the pieces together bring me closure? But I've never done a whole face before, and I don't want to mess it up. It has to be right. I hear Dad turning on the Fox 5 News and sighing, and I remember what Mrs. Brooks said about practicing empathy. So I go into the living room, and I look at Dad's shoes. Hi, Dad. Hi, Caitlin, he says. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to say next. His shoes don't give me any clues. Um, so how are you? I say. Dad looks up at the sofa. Actually, I'm dealing with a lot of stuff right now, he says. Oh, are you looking for closure? I ask. Yeah, in a way I am. Me too. Maybe you could come and see Mrs. Brooke. She said you could do that sometimes, even though she mostly sees kids at school. Dad nods. Maybe you could see someone else too. Dad doesn't say anything. He doesn't even nod. Maybe you could find answers in some books. Thanks, Caitlin. I appreciate it, but I'll figure out a way. When? I ask. I don't know. I think it will take a long time. How are you going to do it? I don't even know where to begin. He stares at the rug, even when the phone rings. Phone, I tell him. It rings again. Phone! And again. Phone! I say loud, in case he didn't hear. Please answer it, he asks. I get a recessed feeling in my stomach. I hate answering the phone. I don't know who it is or who it will be or what they'll say. And the phone rings two more times. Caitlin, please, Dad asks. So I run over to the phone and I grab it because I hate shouting even worse than the phone. At least you can hang up on the phone. Hello, says the voice. Hello. It sounded like Aunt Jolene. Is anyone there? Dad and I are here, I say. Oh, Caitlin, it's you. Hi. I wait for her to talk more. Are you still there? Yes. Oh, I wasn't sure because you weren't talking. That's because you were talking, and it's rude to talk when someone else is talking. Oh, well, so, um, what are you up to, she asks, talking on the phone with you. Can I speak to your dad? I looked at the sofa. Dad is still staring at the spot on the rug. He's dealing with a lot of stuff right now, but he won't read any books about it or go see Miss Brooke or any other counselor. Dad looks up from the sofa. Who is it? Aunt Jolie, I think. Wait, is this Aunt Jolie? Yep, you guessed it. It's Aunt Jolie, I said. He oofs, like there's a lot of air being let out of him when he stands up and he reaches for the phone. I gave it to him, and he leans against the wall. Hi, Jojo, he said. Jojo is Dad's name for Aunt Jolie. It's a nickname, like Scout. Dad, and, Dad is Aunt Jolie's big brother, like Jem, like Devin, like Devin was. Dad still has Aunt Jolie's finger-painted handprint from when she was in kindergarten in a little blue frame on the wall by the TV, and it says, To Hair. Because on it, because when she was five, she wasn't very smart, and she couldn't spell Dad's name the right way, which is Harry. H-A-R-E. Get it? Hair. E. Dad shakes his head while he talks to Angelie. I can't afford to see a counselor. Silence. What insurance? I don't have any insurance. Silence. Do you know how much it costs to see a counselor? Silence. Even clinics charge something unless you make no money at all, and I'm not quitting my job just so I can see a counselor. Silence. Yes, I'm sure it would help her, but she's got a counselor at school at least. I don't know what else I could do. Silence. I know, Jojo. Of course you can't leave them. They're too young. Dad is nodding. I wish you lived closer, too. You're still my best friend. And when he says the word friend, a cry comes out of him. He slides down the wall and he sits on the floor. He drops his head and he tries to cover it with the hand that is holding the phone, but I can see that his head is shaking right along with his hand on the phone, and I can hear him sniffling too. Then he takes a deep breath and he looks up at Aunt Julia's hamper on the wall and he says thank you. I try not to listen to Dad because I've had all the empathy that I can take right now, 
And empathy, guess what, can make you feel kind of sad sometimes. So I put my head under the sofa cushion and I peek out at Devin's chest that he was making. I hear Dad say thank you again, and I keep staring at Devin's chest because it makes me feel like a little bit of him is still there, even though I know he'll never be able to teach me how to finish making that chest, even though he won't be able to teach me anything, even though I will never see him again, I won't ever be able to look at him and say thank you. The more I look at the chest, the more I start turning it from a sharp-shaped sheet into something soft. I guess I'm, a st I'm stuffed animaling everything, even though I don't mean to. It's easy when your eyes are already blurry. I want you to take a second in your ELA notebooks and just kind of summarize, A, these two chapters that we just read. Um, maybe talk a little bit about empathy and how it applies to you in your life. And then empathize with Caitlin and her dad right now. If you were in their shoes, how would you be feeling? What would you be trying to inspire in your family if you were Caitlin and you were seeing that one of your parents was struggling so much? Jot that down in your ELA notebook and I'll be checking for this entry when we do our note check at the end of the week. All right, guys, be kind to one another. See you next time.